Hey guys, Mark Holthe here, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher, coming to you live once again here on the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page um, with another edition of our Express Entry Live Q&A. I had a wonderful weekend this past weekend. I was able to do a little bit of hiking, which usually I do horseback riding, but I was able to get out to our lovely Waterton National Park, which is like a second home for me. And we really got to take advantage of that sunshine the moment it starts to shine here in, uh, in Canada during the summer because it's so short. So I was able to get out there this weekend. It was awesome. And as we wait a little bit for people to tune in, uh, Miriam says, hi, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing really good, Miriam. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share a few little pictures for you. I'm going to just while we're waiting for people to join in, bear with me, I'm going to slide over here and just print off some of the questions that were sent in by email by the listeners. Now, I want to apologize. Some of you sent them to Stephanie, and Stephanie is away on vacation this week, and um, I didn't have time to get in and look at her questions, so I'll consider yours for next week. But let me just see on my other computer here. I've got a dual monitor system going here. I'm going to flip over there, and I'm going to take a look and see... Um, uh, yeah, I'm just going to see how many people have sent questions, so give me a second. All right, now I'm going to go grab them. Hang tight, I'll be right back. All right, Thacker says hi. How are you, Thacker? Okay, I think I'm back together. It's always a little bit challenging. Um, Stephanie's been really good to help get the questions ready for me and and uh, remove some of the stresses and distractions that I have before we go live. Um, but she's on holiday, so now I'm back to figuring things out on my own. Uh, give me a thumbs up if the audio is okay. Uh, she also was doing the audio test for me. So you, you'll remember last week I showed a video and then, <laughs> and then the audio kept playing. So bear with me as I get back into the, the groove of these Express Entry Live Q&As. Um, I had that little stint where I was a little bit uh, out of commission there, having some surgery, but I'm feeling a lot, lots better. I'm going to share just a couple little photos here with you. Um, just while we're waiting for everybody to, to come online. Uh, let's see who's here with us. Abhishek says, Hi Mark, what's up? Enjoy the summer. I am enjoying the summer, Abhishek. Thanks so much. And uh, Thacker says he's fine. Ralph says, Hi. Hi Ralph. Good friend. Um, and Thacker says, And how are you? I'm doing good. All right, give me a second here. I'm just going to pull up a few little videos um, just so you can get an idea of where I was. Let's see here if I can find some good ones here. Um, I went on a hike and uh, it was about four kilometers I think total. Let me just, I'll just pull up a few. This is a hike that I did on my own. So it wasn't, um, <laughs> uh, my family we went on the Saturday up to part way up and then on the Monday I just felt like doing a little bit more. So I went up uh, by myself actually which was the first time I've actually done a hike by myself and um, without all of the family but it was awesome. So let me just see if I can find some good images here as I get up to the lake. There we go. We'll do that one. Actually we'll do this one here and this one there and I think people are probably there those are good and I will share those ones with all of you here in about two seconds as soon as I can get these uh, my phone to to communicate here there it is okay there okay so let's see who else is tuned in oh guys I forgot could you post um, 
in the feed here where you're listening from. That's something that I forgot to do last week. I really want to see where everybody's watching from and uh, if you could post those to um, to the, the feed here, that would be awesome. So let's see where everybody's tuning in from all over the world. Okay, all right, there we go. Okay, so I got some photos. Okay, while we're doing that, and as you guys are posting where you're tuning in, so um, Katoons from Bangladesh, awesome. Uh, and then lots of people are saying Canada is their dream, which is, you know what, I love, I love where I live. I'm, uh, I'm a proud, proud Canadian. Okay, we've got people, where is everybody tuning in from? Um, Hyderabad, India, Libya, uh, you seem busy, Mark. Yes, I am busy. <laughs> Ralph, absolutely Ralph Edmonton. Um, let's see what else we have here. Jamie says, watching from South Africa, cool. Uh, Hossam's from Jordan, Faraz is Pakistan, cool. Okay, while we're waiting for a few other people to post where they're tuning in from, I'll just show you a few pictures. So this first one here and it's always harder when you're doing little selfies but this picture you can see down by the lake if you follow the the ravine all the way back down i actually came up along trails all along there and then climbed some pretty steep sw uh, steep switchbacks is what we call so rather than climbing straight up the hill there's these paths that kind of run almost parallel with a little bit of an incline and it was a pretty steep climb especially after having my gallbladder out but I needed to do something that was actually um, uh, good and get out and, and just have um, a little bit more fresh air, as you would say. Now, here is the destination. So this is where I was going. And this is just a little shot of Bertha Lake, it's called. And uh, there's you can see there's lots of bushes and trees all around the outside. And so I actually had to walk about another kilometer back in towards the back of the lake in order to try to find a place where I could actually um, throw a line in and, and try to fish. And so um, I'll show you ultimately where I ended up, which was right here. And uh, finally, after walking kind of all the way around, and this image is showing back to kind of where I came from, although you can't really see it because there's a, the lake actually curves around uh, where it looks like it's ending there at the back. It actually wraps around and it continues back. So I walked about a kilometer to get to here, and then I put my, uh, took my hiking boots off and put, um, and put my uh, little wading sandals on, and it was so windy. So there's probably this place here, and then you can see all the way across on the other side, there's another trail uh, where, the, where the landslide has kind of knocked all the trees out. That's about the only other real place that I had room to fish, but I wasn't gonna walk the full four kilometers all the way around the lake just to fish. Um, but unfortunately, I had no luck. But regardless, it was an awesome, awesome hike, and I had a lot of fun, and so that's that was the weekend for me. I'm, uh, I'm sure you guys all had lots of cool things that you were doing. Okay, let's see what we have here for where people are tuning in from. Okay, this is my favorite part, it really is. I love seeing how far these videos are reaching. And uh, okay, Lawrence says he's from Guyana. Really, Lawrence, that's so cool, awesome. Uh, my son, I think Lawrence, you may have heard, is in Suriname. So he is speaking a little Dutch there. Um, all right, Jamie's, yes, South Africa. Hossam is Jordan. Faraz is Pakistan. Uh, Chishti is Copenhagen. Cool, Denmark, awesome. Um, Chi is in Grand Prairie. Chi, did you know that I had an office in Grand Prairie? Our firm actually has an office there. Uh, Mohammed's Pakistan. Dadi's is Philippines. Uh, Blessing is Nigeria. Very cool, guys. Uh, we've got someone else from Jordan, but the name is appearing, it looks like in Arabic. Um, and then Adi is Dubai. Cool. Guys, this is great. Aisha is in Pakistan. Awesome. So this is really, really cool. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that, guys. All right. Well, those of you who are tuning in for the first time, um, basically what happens here is I always start with, well, sometimes I share a little bit about what I've been doing in my life just because these things can get so boring. And I want you guys to realize that I'm a live human being. I'm just like you, um, scrounging to, to do what I can to provide for my family and, and to do something that I love, which is immigration. And so uh, often I wanna share a little bit about who I am so that you actually know I'm not just this talking head on Facebook, but I'm, I'm a person just like you. 
And so I love to share a little bit about myself. Then once I get through that part and we do some of the introductions, uh, those who sent emails, in this case, to stephanie at stringham.ca, and Stephanie, like I said, is she's away, and you have to put EE Live Q&A in the subject line, so don't forget about that. When you've done those two things, then you have the ability to send a question in, like these folks right here did, and then I will answer those questions first. Then once we're through them, then all of you awesome people that are tuning in live, um, I will answer your questions. Now, I want to remind everybody, this is now being broadcast on the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page. What that allows you to do is to share this with everyone. So go ahead right now and tag any of your friends that you think might want to be watching this right now, um, but don't realize that I've gone live. And then also, I'm going to share my screen with you guys here. And there we are. Um, I've got a new site that I'm in the process of kind of building out here. And this is where I'm hosting my express entry um, do-it-yourself guide. And I'm also building out a bunch of other ones, which I talk about a lot. Everything seems like it's a, a work in progress. But when you go to the Canadian Immigration Institute um, uh, Facebook page in here, you can actually no, you can actually click right here where it says like or follow or whatever. And that, when I go live, you'll have a better likelihood of actually getting notified when I do a live video. So go in there, share this. Uh, video that we're doing right now that's being broadcast to anyone that you think might be interested because let's face it Facebook doesn't always always work with me and uh, if someone passes through the video feed and feels like today they don't have time to watch it well then Facebook says well I guess they don't want to watch it and then you don't receive any notifications so feel free to share this with uh, anyone else that you feel might be interested in watching out on in Facebook land all right, so why don't we start, guys? Uh, let's see, we've got Gurjeet is the UK here, and uh, Sona is Pakistan. Awesome. <laughs> and Ralph, you're special, Mark. Thanks, buddy. Okay, and Georgia says you're a good person. You guys are, you guys are awesome. But you know what? I'm no different than you guys. You guys are all good people, too. Okay, so let's jump in here. So this one here is uh, from Rushdie. And the question is, hi, Mark. My wife is in Australia and I am in Bangladesh. I am the main applicant. We've passed the medical examination. We will be receiving um, invitation for biometrics soon. Is it possible to give our biometrics in two different countries? If so, what do we have to do? 100%. So when you get those instructions, um, your wife can go to wherever uh, the, there is a, a, a VFS, global or a VAC, we call them, Visa Application Center, and she can have her medical, uh, sorry, her biometrics done there and you can have yours done in Bangladesh. That's not a problem. So uh, all of the uh, visa application centers, at least most of them, are equipped now to take biometrics. So you can easily just schedule an appointment, follow exactly the instructions that are on that, the website for that location, and they do vary. So it just depends on which visa application center you're looking at going to in Australia or Bangladesh. All right. Great question, uh, Rashvi. Okay, next one, this is um, Rajahat, and uh, Raji says, um, Hi Mark, good day. I want to ask, is it possible to claim points for two different knocks, such as 1111 and 2222, if both fall under the same skill level, like 0 or A? Also, there's no option for mentioning two different knocks while creating the profile. How to reflect the second knock to count as experienced by IRCC? Okay, so you have to choose your primary knock. You can't use two different knocks. It has to be in one knock. That's and what is what is the the, the minimum expectation? One year full time paid skilled work experience. Skill level at least B, A, or O, or zero, I guess. So those three, um, it has to be at that skill level. But you you can't um, select two knock codes as your primary occupation. So you have to choose one and it has to meet that standard. Now you can accumulate that time over two years if you're working part-time. Full-time is considered 30. Part-time is considered 15 hours per week. So in your situation, how do you claim work experience for both? Well, once you've crossed over and demonstrated that you have, if you're applying through the Federal Skilled Worker Program outside of Canada, once you've demonstrated that you have that one minimum, full, uh, minimum 
um, continuous full-time employment that's paid, then you're good. Then in the work history section, you're going to continue down and you're going to list your other work histories. If it's 2222 is your NOT code for those, then you're going to list those in the work history and they don't have to be the same. But the primary NOC, you always have to have one that meets the minimum requirements. Okay, excellent. All right. And you know what, guys? That's it. So let's take some time. This is a quick, a quick one in terms of those who were sending in questions via email. Um, now, I'm going to devote the time to all of you. So like I said, if you have friends or anyone you know who'd like to watch, tag this. Let them know and, um, uh, and we can go from there. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Oh, and I see people are doing that. Awesome. Great. Okay, so we'll start with uh, Farouk. So Farouk says, Hi Mark, any PNP for accountant or dentist? Uh, our age is high and points are in between 350 to 370. EE is not possible for us, however, we um, and the wife both have profiles and hoping for a relevant PNP. Also, any hope uh, from Arima Portal of Quebec? You know what, guys? This is something that I get probably more questions than ever before. As the comprehensive ranking system keeps climbing up and up and up, the reality is it's going to become more and more difficult for people to qualify independently. So if it's the case here, like we talked about with Farouk, if your age is not giving you a lot of points, then the reality is your chances of immigrating to Canada are becoming um, very, very remote because every single point counts now, especially when there's many candidates who are in Canada. Now all of those students and anyone working are now transitioning to permanent residence and there just are not as many spots available for international immigrants who do not have a connection with Canada. So the PNPs are, are true, it makes sense. And uh, I'm just going to go here and I'll just show you something. Having your profile in the pool is super important to get it in. So you just, it's important to get it in, okay? Um, because what happens is if you have a profile and it's in there but yet you, um, uh, but yet your score is low, there is still an outside chance that you might be able to receive a passive invitation through one of the passive programs. And um, one of those programs is the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program's Human Capital Priority Stream. And that whole priority stream, it changes, it adjusts, it adapts, and every once in a while they do a draw. And I'm actually just looking right now to see if I can find the um, uh, the, the most recent draw and if any of you out there <laughs> have um, can can post the link to the most recent draw that that they um, that the OINP did for tech folks I know because I've got some clients in it uh, but I'm just having trouble finding it on the government website if you've got that and you know where to find it can you post it in the links and then I'll pull it up and then people will understand so basically some provinces based on your occupation will extend an invitation to you passively so it's not a formal application that you make and so by having your profile in that is going to give you a chance if your primary knock is in line with the occupations that that um, that various provinces uh, are in demand and need to fill so sometimes they'll pull people from express entry generally speaking for most people though um, uh, you know there's some programs that where you can actually apply and uh, without having a, a, you know, a connection per se with any province, but those are becoming fewer and fewer far between. So I don't have a lot of information that I can give you, um, uh, like to be honest, uh, Farouk. The, the reality is every person is different. Uh, the occupations in terms of accountant or dentist are not ones that are highly sought after within provinces, it's very rare that you would have that because those professional designations are often in, you know, there's lots of Canadians that work in those occupations. Um, I know, like when it comes to a dentist, I have two brother-in-laws that are dentists and one is an oral surgeon. And so there's lots of professionals and the same thing goes for accountants. So it's probably not as likely for that you're going to have um, uh, an occupation specific. 
uh, request for those occupations. And it's tough. So what do you do when you're older? The likelihood of getting a study permit is very low. Immigration usually says, seriously, you're a dentist and you want to go to school in Canada? And they refuse the study permit. And we're seeing it now. The trends are increasing. Study permit refusals all over the world, even for strong, strong candidates, because they're now realizing, whoa, we have so many international students that are all going to come through express entry, and we just don't have room to handle them all. And so at this stage, there is a, uh, a definite propensity to make it difficult to get study permits. Not impossible, because obviously hundreds of thousands of people get them each year, but it's becoming more and more difficult. Okay, all right, um, let's see who's next here. Um, Okay, so let's start here. I'm not sure who, uh, what this person's name is. Um, they say, I'm still preparing for the documents, let's see, uh, needed for express entry. I am now um, at the ECA stage uh, with the MCC because I'm a doctor. I'm supposed to send a certified copy of my passport and my university degree. I have to renew my passport around January, February 2020. I'm concerned about the new passport thing. Can it cause any trouble regarding my application and my ECA? Any advice? No. Many people have to renew passports. Many, many times they're in the, they, they have their application in the express entry pool for quite a while. And in that time, when they first submitted it, their passport was going to be expiring in a year. Well, you can't often ex uh, extend a passport when there's still a year of validity left. So many people run into the situation where they filed their profile with one passport and ultimately they get their passport request and submit another one. So that's not a problem at all. If you have used one passport to request your MCC uh, educational credential assessment and then your profile or you've said you've got your profile in I think already but if you get an ITA and you're submitting your EAPR and you have a new passport that's not a problem at all. I would if you wanted to you could include a copy of the old one that you used to get your ECAs but it's not really something that you have to worry about. All right good question. Okay, Ibrahim says, hello there. What are the chances for a software developer with experience of three years full-time job? Two different countries, Jordan, Saudi. Guys, when it comes to requesting your chances for immigrating, it's not really something that I can delve into um, within, and I, I took some liberties there with the first one, but it's really not something that I can do here in a live Facebook thing. And the reason is, I wanna know everything there is to know about you. I wanna know your history, your family, what you do, all of these things and that's what I do in immigration consultations and the reason I do consultations is because then when I give advice it's not based on a few things that you've told me but it's based on all of the questions that I ask when we get together and do a live Skype interview just like we're just it's basically you see exactly what you see right here this is how I do my Skype consultations and Ibrahim and all of you that want direction and are looking for advice on your chances of going through Express Entry, sometimes the best advice in the world that you can get is to reach out to me. And if your scores are low, have me say, you know what, the likelihood of you qualifying to immigrate to Canada is very low. Then at least you know, and you're not throwing away money um, with consultants who are just you know, feeding you a line of, uh, you know, uh, making it look like your chances are higher than they really are and they're only interested in taking your money. Um, so those paid consultations are the way that I can go through everything and usually in about half an hour and I charge $200 Canadian but in that time we can usually go through everything. All right, um, those of you who know where the link is, let me just see if I can find that and I'll just post it in the feed here so that you can find it. I'll just shift my screen and then I will go to the actual page. This is what it looks like and here schedule a consultation right there and you can see here 21250 is basically the cost for 25 minutes uh, of consultation and um, and you can enter your information in here. I'll just put the link in in the chat there for everybody and if you want to book a consult especially those who are looking for direction or advice that short little um, consultation, usually I can give you a really, really good idea of what you need to do to improve your chances or be honest with you and tell you, look, you should consider other countries, which is advice that I'm giving people now. Okay, um, okay, let's take a look here. Uh, Kabir says, hi Mark, how are you? I wanna know when does the five-year mark start on landing or the day we get our PR card? The five-year mark with your permanent resident card it really starts from the date 
you submit your permanent resident uh, card extension application backwards five years. So basically what I mean is um, the time period that they look at when they're looking at whether or not you've met your residency requirements for permanent residence is actually um, five years backwards from the date that you submit your application. So if you have been in Canada, um, well let's say you come into Canada for a couple weeks and then you leave the country. Well in those circumstances it's still the same thing. You, if you come back in say after two years you come back in so that you've only been out of Canada for about two years then and you stay in Canada and submit your application um, they will then you know you're going to be in Canada for another two years you know or more till you reach the five-year time period and your PR card is the thing that's expiring so after five years your PR card expires so if you want to travel that's when you have to renew it if you never ever travel in all honesty you never even need to renew your PR card the permanent resident card is more to allow you to travel on commercial carriers it's your confirmation of permanent residence that proves you are a Canadian permanent resident so with the time period once again it's five years backwards from the date that you submit your application. So I guess one real extreme example would be someone who lived in Canada for 15 years. They never bothered renewing their PR card. Um, and then, but they never really travel outside of Canada. Then 15 years later, they decide, oh, I want to travel. I want to go back to India or see family. And so they apply for a PR card. Then at that stage, they look backwards to see where you were living. Okay, good question. Um, all right, Kabir, good question. Okay, um, Jamie Lee says, Hi Mark, this is very informative, thanks. My question is around the NOT codes too. My title falls into one NOT code, but my main duties uh, falls into another. I've chosen the one that includes the majority of my responsibilities duties, is this correct? 100%. Now understand that the, the title of your position isn't the thing that's important. What's important is that your duties um, are the, the duties that you perform match a substantial number of the main duties listed in the NOC. So if we go here and I'll share my screen and we'll go to the NOC 2016 because that's what the government's using right now and we open it up and then let's just type in 1111 okay so we'll pull this up and we'll see that this is basically accountants and I think everybody can see my screen okay okay you can see accountants and when it comes to duties, what you're looking at is showing that you perform all of the activities in the lead statement and that you can show that you have performed a substantial number of the main duties. And, um, you know, in many cases, the government's instructions say essential duties. Well, basically anything that says may, may supervise, that's not mandatory. You can toss it out. So for, in this case, these ones right here are the duties. So you need to show that you have performed a substantial number of these main duties, which gener generically speaking, it's not a hard and fast rule, but sometimes we kind of go by about 75%, okay? So that's what auditors do. And then accountants, in the same way, you can see here we've got may act as a trustee, may supervise and train. So these are discretionary, they're not mandatory, but you would work off of these duties right here, okay? So that's what's important. Great question, Jamie Lee. All right, next one, uh, Parth says, Hey Mark, with the help of your EEDUI guide today, I submitted all my documents and got an acknowledgement of receipt. Woo, that's awesome. That is so cool, Parth. That is so cool. Um, I used cam scanner for the scanning docs. Is that fine? Dude, you're not supposed to ask me <laughs> if something is fine after you've already submitted it. So, uh, so um, I submitted all my documents and got an acknowledgement of receipt. You're supposed to ask me before. Okay, let's see what questions you have. I use the cam scanner. That's fine. You can do that. You know, 90% of the people in the world use these, right? So it's not uncommon. Um, now my proof of funds documents includes bank letter, bank statements, gift deeds. Wow, three gift deeds. That's a lot of gift deeds. So after compression, the quality of the PDF went down. Can I get rejected based on that? Um, can I send you that PDF in a personal message and you can tell me if I'm safe? Okay, so Parth, reviewing documents and all those kinds of things, you know that's what I do for a living. And so that would be a charge, that would be a paid consult for me to go through everything with you. And we could probably do it in about half an hour. 
Um, but it really comes down to whether or not an officer can actually read it. Um, they know that with four megabytes that they give you per section, sometimes you don't always have the ability to provide a real clear, clear copy because the size of that file is so large and you have to condense it and shrink it down. But the key is that they can read all the information on it. If they can read it, then you're fine. If they can't, then that's going to be an issue. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Oh, so we've got Alberta here. And uh, this is the irritating part. So Gurjeet's being very kind and he's sharing the information for Alberta and for Ontario. And um, Campbell Cohen's site, uh, David Cohen's site, they're always pushing this stuff out, which is great. It's, you know, it's a real helpful service with this, their CIC news. If you can find it on the actual government site, so then people know where to look themselves. If you, if you could find that, Gurjeet, so for the OINP and for Alberta, it should be just in the news sections. But if you can post those, that would be great too. And maybe CIC News has a link to it. That's possible as well. Um, so great. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, yes, Ontario Tech Draw is August the 1st, Gurjeet says. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, Farouk says, thanks a lot. You're very, very welcome. Um, and I appreciate your support too, Farouk. Okay, uh, Israr says, I am Ahmed from Japan. I ask you some questions, please. Yeah, you just got to post them, my friend. Faraz, do I meet this category? I'm a lecturer in government college and I have two children, a girl, a boy, and I'm 38 years for us, you're going to need a whole lot more information. And this is where I recommend you book a consultation. But for those of you who are wondering if you do meet eligibility requirements, I'll, I will share with you um, one site and the government website has some generic tools. So I call it the Come to Canada tool. I haven't done it for a long time. But if you type in Come to Canada tool immigration, uh, let's just see here if this works. Okay, yes. So here, you can check your eligibility here at this link. And um, it's not a perfect tool because there's always, the, 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 what, the answer you get back will depend upon how you fill in the information here. Um, but this is basically where you can assess your eligibility at a very basic level. All right, okay, I hope that helps. All right. Um, okay, okay, thank you. It is a relief. I am Allah. Oh, okay, great, Allah. It is in Arabic. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, let's see what we have here, our next person here. Um, okay, Gasharan says, Hi, I'm in the situation. I'm in a situation and I need your help very badly. My wife got her Indian police clearance in India, March 2019. Her last date of residence in India is April. She then moved to Canada. I submitted my application with the same please clearance of hers and my acknowledgement of receipt date is July the 17th. I was going through the few forms and I'm a little worried now. Was her PC valid since she moved to Canada? Um, do I need to get another new PCC and submit it through web form? This is one that's always a little bit tricky. So if we do the time, so March, and you didn't say what the date was for March. So March um, is when, her, uh, when she got it. So April, May, June, July. August, September is, that's, what do we got there? Six months, I think. So you're, I don't see any issues. I don't know why there would be an issue with that at all. It just needs to be valid at the time in which you submit your EAPR. So if that was the case, then you're not going to, it should not be an issue. Um, it shouldn't. Uh, ultimately, if you feel like you want to obtain another one and upload it to the web, um, uh, the, the web form, you, you can do that. But remember, it's six months that it's valid. Now, last year, I think we had someone come back and say how an officer rejected it um, because the police clearance expired or it was beyond six months by the time they looked at it. But um, I think I would have challenged that refusal in federal court because as long as a police uh, certificate is, is valid at the time in which you submit your EAPR, um, you should be fine. But I can tell you, because of the discretion that officers have, I don't want to have to go through the whole hassle of trying to prove that an officer made a mistake. So I don't take any chances. If I have a client that has a police certificate that is, um, that is four months old or older, I will often have them go and request another one so that we have a nice fresh one, if it's, if it's possible. If there isn't time, then we just submit it. We just do. 
And um, rarely do I get another one unless it's specifically requested by IRCC. But if you're concerned, um, uh, Gasharn, you can, like there's always the possibility of you doing that and then uploading it into the system. All right, excellent. Okay, um, uh, Lena says, if I want to land in Alberta but have a transit in Toronto for three hours, do I have to complete my immigration papers in Toronto Airport and will that affect my final landing in Alberta in any way? Health insurance, sins? No, not a problem at all. Many people will land at whatever airport is the best flight into Canada and then they will transit across to where they ultimately end up living. The only time it's an issue is if you are trying to move to a province different than um, a province that nominated you through one of the provincial nominee programs. That's a no-no. That's something that you want to avoid. But when it comes to um, transiting through Toronto to Alberta, that's not a problem at all. Okay, um, let's go to uh, Said here. Uh, could someone have an old record of landing dated valid until have status? Oh, so Sa Said says, can someone with a record of landing uh, valid until January 31st, 1989, have status. He left Canada in 1994 and never come back again. Well, I can tell you that from a residency standpoint, he has not met his residency obligations. However, if he was back in Canada um, and an officer on the border didn't have issues with uh, allowing him to come back into Canada, which is virtually impossible these days, it's really tough. Um, you're always a permanent resident until an actual uh, residency determination has been made. So um, obviously if he was trying to show that he was still a permanent resident of Canada, it would be very, very unlikely that that would be possible. Um, but that's a good question. You know, technically, you know, that person still is a permanent resident of Canada until a decision is made otherwise by the government even though he hasn't maintained the residency obligations. So that's a whole different discussion. If they want to book a consult, we can talk about all the, the possibilities and all the options that might be available. Um, but remember now with this whole world of electronic travel authorizations and, um, and visa requirements, it's going to be difficult for them to come to Canada without an officer asking questions about residency. All right. Uh, Benny says, can I use proof of property ownership as proof of funds? Nope, you can't. Those funds need to be liquid. In other words, they have to be cash or funds in your account that are available and are not otherwise encumbered. And uh, yeah, a property assessment um, showing what your property is worth, a valuation wouldn't work. Okay, Enos says, hi Mark, four months after acknowledgement of receipt, I got a procedural fairness letter. Okay, basically, they had done online research and based on online sources they had about my workplace. They were mistaken because had not identified in online sources the correct company where I work. So to substantiate my work, I sent my payrolls, bank, business registra registration, certificate, etc. I think what I sent is a lot of exhaustive docs. How long might it take to get a response after sending these docs? A proof of funds letter, a new procedure can be expected after it. Thanks. Ina, this is one that I can't really tell you without looking at everything. Um, I can't say uh, you know, and the reality is once they've sent a fairness letter out, then at that stage um, it could take many months for them to sort through things. So there isn't any specific timeline. Um, ultimately you've done what you um, believe is, is sufficient. I do want to advise everyone that if you do get a fairness letter, it makes a lot of sense to reach out and book a consult with me so that we can look at exactly what their concerns are because sometimes you don't know. Right? Sometimes they're clear and they say, well, we don't believe your work history is, is valid or genuine or, or we don't believe that the funds are really yours or you know, who knows what their concerns may be. But you really, really have to be careful because when the fairness letter comes, it means an officer has questions about whether or not you've told the truth or the information that you've sent, whether or not it actually is sufficient to meet the eligibility requirements for, for express entry. So I just advise you to consider booking a consult. But, uh, but Ina, good luck. It looks to me like you put a lot of work into that. And as far as timing, it's really hard to say. Okay, uh, Kabir, sir, what's the maximum time to get GCMS notes? Total number of days. There is no maximum time. If you want the truth, I submitted one and it took over two years. In fact, I forgot about it and I, apparently they did too. 
um, and the client didn't have any interest in pursuing anymore. And, and lo and behold, I got it over two years later. So don't even get me started with the maximum time. All right. Um, okay, Parth just does a follow up here and says all are, are readable, then you should be just fine. Okay. And he said, P.S., your EEDIY guide was really helpful. You are very, very welcome, my friend. And for those of you who are wondering how to access it, I've actually now, I'm hosting it on a different site. And so you can see right here, there's the link. And uh, actually, you can probably just access it straight here. I haven't yet put it up on my, um, on my own domain because we're just still in the initial stages, but you can access it right here on this website and I just posted the link for everybody. Okay, now let's see if I can figure out where I just left off from. <laughs> okay, all right, there's Ina, Kabir, me, Parth. Okay, thanks and um, yeah, Parth, I'm glad that it was super helpful. And uh, the reality is all of you guys, no matter what stage you're at, the guide is designed to help people at all stages of where they were, uh, where they are within the express entry system. And it's a fraction of the cost of what you would normally pay. And I don't usually say, say this until the very end, but if you reach out to me, we haven't yet set up uh, the discount coupons, but if you send me a message, I will give you an access code that allows you to get 50% off um, the lifetime access to the course. Okay, uh, Gurjeet, oh, he puts the link right there. Great, thanks so much, my friend. Jazdeep's giving me a thumbs up. Hi, my friend, good to see you. Um, okay, all right, this is great. So um, I'll just, Humayun here, Kabir, is trying to solicit people to, um, to use a service. So uh, Humayun, I'm just gonna actually remind you that you're not supposed to do that within the group and you'll probably be removed from the group. So I recommend that you don't post those comments anymore. All right, uh, let's see here. Um, okay, Benayash, uh, Benayash, I'm working two jobs. My first job is the one I'm using to fill my bank account and I'm not ex extracting any money from it. Okay, great. My second job is a cash part-time that I use for my everyday needs. Will this affect my pro proof of funds and do I have to declare my second cash part-time job? Um, remember, your part-time job is probably going to be listed in your personal history. So it's, on, it's being honest in what you're doing. So you may be doing two jobs and that's totally fine. Maybe you only want to claim one for your work history, that's totally fine but always, always disclose everything you're doing. When it comes to proof of funds, the government just wants to see that the income you're earning is coming from work and um, that these are your savings and they're readily available for you to be able to settle in Canada. Other than that, they don't really care. It's not really a big deal at all. Okay. Um, okay. Wajahat says, hi Mark, can we claim points for two different uh, knocks? Okay, yeah, I've already answered that one. Dadi says, hi Mark, how about express entry as a clinical pharmacist? What are the possibilities? Interested in Toronto area. Dadi's that question would require a paid consult. So same thing, if you guys are wondering whether or not you qualify or what the options are, there's no way I can really do it justice here. And I wouldn't want to, because if I answered your question just ext just based on the question that you, the information that you've given me, well, you give me very, very limited information. And the, in a live Facebook feed, it really doesn't, um, it's not, it wouldn't do it justice. And I would be afraid that I'd give you advice that would maybe neglect or forget about other possibilities just because in a consult, it's not just you giving me information, but it's me grilling you. It's me asking you the specific questions that allow me to canvas all possibilities, things that you hadn't even considered. That's why a consultation is so good. Okay, Ricardo says, what about young professionals IEC for Mexicans? That, that, that's a whole separate discussion, Ricardo. Once again, a consult, we could go through everything with you, but that's not something I can answer within an express entry uh, process. Okay, here's a question from Gurjeet. He's been working so, so hard to give the links here for everybody. So definitely let me jump in and I'm just gonna share here. Um, let me jump back here and I will uh, answer Gurjeet's question. So, oh, it's an IMP. Do you know what? You've earned the right. So one IMP question. So this is International, Mo International Mobility Program, which is a work, uh, a work question. 
Okay, um, I had a girlfriend in the UK for five years and had a breakup. We had some kind of argument and she called on police and me knowing my illegal status in the UK, she accused me of harassment. I got a warning letter from police saying both of us to not to contact each other. However, I was not charged for anything. If I apply for PCC, I'm worried if that shows on the PCC. Does it will affect my application as a spouse? Okay, so um, I'm... Uh, let's see, you've got IMP here, so I, I just assumed IMP was, uh, I am now think it's an important question is what you wanted me to ask, and not one question, not one related to work permits. So basically, Gurjeet, he, he's asking, I think, uh, a spousal sponsorship. You have to wait and see what comes back on the record. Um, if it was just a warning and there really was no criminal uh, offense registered, then there's nothing to be concerned about. So just remember that when it comes to the actual um, uh, application itself, it's only convictions, convictions that have been registered against you that um, when equated to Canadian criminal convictions uh, would constitute um, a criminal offense and criminal inadmissibility. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we're moving down here. All right, Shara says, Hi Mark, I've graduated from college in TO and currently I'm working as APV since January 19th. Can I submit the PR application on December the 19th? I was graduated on January the, uh, January 2018 for, I should say here, okay, since January of 2019. Can I submit the PR application on December 2019? I was graduated on January the 18th for two years post-grad college. And is there any minimum score for English tests such as IELTS, CELPIP, which I got two subjects? Okay, there's a ton of questions here, Shara. And in all honesty, I think it's probably best that you book a consult. How long the PR process in submission to get the invitation approved? Please advise. You've asked a thousand questions here. Um, the program... Uh, whether it is the Federal Skilled Worker Program or the Canadian Experience class, it comes down to your comprehensive ranking system score. All of those factors are really important. Um, your IELTS scores, roughly six, are probably too low, um, but we need to take a look and so that I could actually advise you on the likelihood of your, your chances of, of getting through. But I won't be able, unfortunately, Shara, to be able to answer that in this. They're just, it, there's, it's not possible. So I recommend that you book a consult. Um, okay, so Gurjeet says, I'm here for 10 years and there's no criminal offense. Then you shouldn't have an issue, Gurjeet. Okay, Parth says, the addresses on the letterhead of my company are their home addresses where they started the company. I love this. Those of you who are watching it, I don't know if you guys can see it, but someone is being really, really intelligent and is giving me lots of thumbs up. So basically, they're doing everything they can, I'm assuming, to try to distract me, I guess. <laughs> and this is what it is, right? Like there's trolls everywhere. I wish I could see who that was. That would be helpful. So then I could block them from the group. That would be even more awesome. <laughs> awesome, okay. All right, so if anyone who's doing that right now, if they would probably stop, that would be helpful for me. Thank you. All right, so um, let's see here. Let's just double check and see what we've got. Give me one second. I'm just going to take a little break here. And when we have, um, that's one of the dangers of putting it through the Canadian Immigration Institute versus the private Facebook group. But that's okay. I'm going to just shift this over here and then I don't have to see distractions any longer. All right. Well, thanks a lot anyways. Whoever was doing that, that's awesome. It just goes to show that the world is full of all kinds of different people, right? <laughs> oh, we got an angry face now. Awesome. Okay, so let's move forward. Okay, this, this one, um, let's continue with Parth. So the address is on the letter. Um, uh, the letterhead of my company uh, are their home address where they started the company. Now, since they've expanded, uh, so they have an office at a different place. Okay, can having residential address on the letterhead and having a different address on the website be a problem? Um, Parth, I would just explain it. Like if it's readily apparent on the uh, the website of the company that they have multiple locations, then that's fine. Um, if you have any concerns or you think an officer might be confused, then I would put that answer into a letter of explanation and just say, hey, you know, they've expanded and that's why, um, yeah, the office is at a different place. Okay, so I don't anticipate that being an issue. 
All right. Hey, we got a heart. I love hearts. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rahat Khan says, hey, Mark. Hi. Uh, Reham says, my work insurance starting date is two months late than my actual work starting date. Is this a problem? Um, I don't think so. I'm not quite sure how that would be an issue. Uh, it, I don't anticipate that being an issue. At the end of the day, if you have any questions, just as the same I, I responded to Parth, um, you're just going to provide a letter of explanation. Okay. Um, Adriana says, hi, how can we get the link for the discount for the DOI guide? Thanks. Oh, Adriana, just send me a private message to Facebook Messenger um, or you can just send me an email and I'll just type my email in here so that you can see at stringham.ca. That is probably an easy way to do it and I'll send that to you right after, Adriana. Okay. Um, Okay, Shiraz is asking questions about spousals, which this is express entry. Um, okay, Abdul, Abdul says, hey Mark, what are the chances of someone who did IELTS test for getting PR in Canada? I, it's mandatory. You have to have an IELTS test to even be assessed, so critical. Um, okay. okay, Wallace says, what are my options if my previous employer is no longer in business? Wow. So the reality is, Wallace, you have to be able to prove everything that IRCC asks for. Um, I remember once I was on a, a panel for Express Entry and one of the audience members asked, um, you know, they said, well, what if our client's uh, school that they went to school has burned down or is closed? And the response from IRCC was, well, that's not our problem. Um, we can't do an educational credential assessment or accept education and actually assign comprehensive ranking system points if there's no ECA available. And uh, when it comes to work in the same light, you have an obligation to prove it. So how do you prove it? Are there tax filings? Is there um, you know, employment income that has been uh, deposited into your account? Do you have pay stubs? Uh, do you have, like, do you file taxes and are your taxes remitted? So all of those things are factors that you can bring in and the list is long and extensive. And actually I've got a special video within my Express Entry Do-It-Yourself guide that addresses all of those things. Um, but uh, do you have co-workers that used to work with you? Do you have supervisors that used to work with you in that business that could provide a statutory declaration? Do you have a hiring letter? Do you have a termination letter? All of those things um, to show what your duties are, how much you were paid, um, that you were working full time, you know, anything to show that, yeah, that you had at least 30 hours a week um, and, uh, you know, that the position was, was skilled. All of those factors are critical. So you have to be very, very creative. If you want to book a consult, we can go through it, Wallace, and we can take a look at it. Okay, Ruck says, uh, I'm a government employee in India. I'm doing knock level C, clerk job. Um, you can't, uh, it's uh, with two and a half years of experience. I want to move to Canada. Is there any scope for me in Express Entry Program? No. Simple as that, Rux. It has to be at least a skill level B. A low skill C level C doesn't work. Um, okay, Yuri says, hi Mark, how are you getting on? I've ordered uh, GCMS notes, however, IRCC failed to deliver them on time. Is it a common thing? Are they overburdened? Yes, extremely common for them to say, hey, we couldn't meet the deadline. Um, we'll get it to you as soon as we can. If you want to file a complaint, you can file a complaint. And it happens a lot. And yes, they are overburdened without a doubt. Uh, Gurjeet says, thanks. You're very welcome, my friend. Uh, Sumit says, hi, Mark. I'm from India. I have a master's degree. Is there a possibility to get a PR? Sumit, consult. <laughs> Book a paid consult with the link um, that I've shared in the feed here. And we can go over and assess your your um, eligibility, not just for Express Entry, but if there's other PNPs. But I can tell you at 447, um, I'm just not sure. But guys, I didn't think it was going to drop down to 438 and 439 earlier this year. So always put it in, always keep your fingers crossed, always do everything you can to increase your score constantly. If it means it's rewriting that darn IELTS, then rewrite it. If it means you can get two more points or three more points. So, um, but at 447 right now, we haven't seen it dip down, but we just don't know. Okay. All right. Um, Harris, uh, hey Mark. Hey Harris, how are you? Um, 
Okay, so Shara says, can you send me the discount link so I can book you for a consult? Thank you. Oh, so Shara, the discount is for my complete step-by-step -step guide to doing it yourself. So that's my do-it-yourself guide. That's the series of video tutorials. And um, the consultation link is separate. And that will take you to the link on my firm website, which is right here. And then you can fill this out and then we can uh, get everything set up for you as quickly as possible, okay? Um, you can also just send me an email to Shara and we can work through whatever you need. Um, okay, Harris says, can joint accounts with parents be used? Have a signed affidavit that the money is mine to use as I wish? Yes, Harris, those are possible, you can. Uh, I would definitely get that letter, that affidavit, 100%. Um, okay, Seif says, I've received recently the request for paying the right of permanent resident fee. Is it a positive sign? Thank you. Yes, Seif, that's an extremely positive sign. You are so close. Rura says, hello, sir, regards to you and your family. Thank you. Uh, our boss says, can you confirm what's info sharing? I mean, what information does Canada share with FCC partners, including UK, US, Australia, New Zealand? Well, one thing I can tell you, they share immigration information. So if they have a question about someone and they want to know whether they had applied for a visa or things like that, absolutely, that fits squarely within it. Um, is there criminal history sharing? Well, in some cases there is, but you have an obligation to obtain and provide a, a police clearance certificate. So you're actually doing that work for them anyways yourself. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So we have Faizan says, hope you're fine and enjoying good health. Um, Faizan's from Pakistan. He's, uh, he says, you're a really wonderful personality and I've been following you for a long time. Thank you. Just because of your guide, many people have already got PRs. Yes, and that's the thing. There's there's a lot of people that have gone through Use the Guide, and I call them my alumni. So my Canadian Immigration Institute alumni. And it's really, you have no idea how good it makes me feel to be able to provide something. Maybe they don't fully engage me as their lawyer, but at least they're able to get information that they can trust and not have to rely on some unscrupulous consultant or someone out there who is just looking to take their money and not really provide any help. So thanks for recognizing that. Okay, uh, he says, I'd like to ask um, that how much investment is required if I want to come to Canada on an investment category? Um, I'm a lawyer and practicing tax law here, and my wife is a medical doctor, and what are the opportunities for both of us in Canada? I want to come on an investment category because our CRS level is, um, is low. Um, do you offer private consult? Yes. So Faizan, this all related to investments, we can talk about all of that. Um, and I would recommend that you book a consult. And you can send an email to me. You can um, go online and do that, whatever works for you. Okay. Uh, when it comes to investment programs in Canada, there really are not a lot. Quebec has some, uh, but our federal program doesn't have a, a mere passive investment scheme. A lot of those have been removed. Uh, some of the provincial nominee programs do have programs, um, and with a consult, we can we can talk a little bit about those things. Okay. Um, all right. Excellent. Okay, Syed says, in your step-by-step -step guide, you have not covered Pakistan PCCs. I visited the local station. They said we'll issue separate PCCs for all the addresses of the same city. I've changed multiple addresses. Yeah, Syed, the reason I don't cover it is because I provide a link um, and explanation of where to get the police clearance certificates. So you always go to the government website. That is the latest, most up-to-date information. I don't have a copy of a Pakistan one because I just haven't chosen to include one. Um, ultimately, in Pakistan, it's one of the few countries that's based on residence. And when you've moved around a lot, yeah, it's a real pain. Most countries are all national in scope. You provide your, your, your um, personal biographical information, birthday, you know, sometimes fingerprints, and then they provide one that's national in scope. But Pakistan, for whatever reason, because I guess the local police authorities are the ones that maintain those criminal record reports, you do have to go to those. So, um, yeah, so, but I'll show you here again, and I know you've probably already done um, uh, your own research, but let's just pull it up here and I'll show you guys. So here we are. And so we'll, you just go here, I'll go to Pakistan, and then which you, I'm sure you've probably already looked at. 
So live in, if you live in Pakistan, you know, smaller areas, and all the information is right there. Okay, but that's a good question, Syed. And I hope that the, the rest of the guide has been helpful to you. Okay, uh, Adriana says, thanks a lot. You're very welcome. We're just about at the end here, guys. We're crossed over to uh, 104. And um, so I'm going to have to wrap this up pretty quick, but I'll answer a few more questions. Um, okay, Aryan says, I had a gift of 4000 from my father, but the check got returned as my dad's account was inactive. Um, it later got cleared and all that shows in the bank statement. Would that be a problem? Ariane, that's something that I can't really answer. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, um, yeah, the, the nature of how that is displayed within the account. So I'm sorry I won't be able to answer that question. Okay. Um, let's see here. Wallace says, thanks, Mark. You're very welcome. Okay, Mo says, hi, Mark. Is there any way one can speed up his or her asylum hearing after filing for it? Um, second question has to do with traveling out of Canada as a refugee. Each of these questions, Mo, are, are kind of outside of the scope of express entry, but there really isn't, there really isn't any way to expedite your refugee application. Um, it just it follows the regular course and even after if your refugee application is refused um, even removals are not always fast so it uh, yeah the processing times are not really set at least there's no way to speed it up faster than how long it's taking right now um, okay Sulafa says hi I'm a pharmacist and I'm considering PNP and I'm about to submit my profile. My question is if I have good chance to be nominated with CRS 346 points. Um, okay, the reality is, Sulafa, with 346, your likelihood is pretty low. That score is, is far underneath what the express entry draws are right now. And so, but like I said, it just depends. Some provinces may be looking for a pharmacist. So you put your profile in and, and then you just let it ride. And if there are certain uh, provinces that have programs that you can actively apply for, then do that. Uh, some of them open up for very, very short periods of time and you have to be very vigilant. Uh, but, uh, but 346 is pretty low and I think it would be very unlikely that you could. Um, anything is possible, but low likelihood. Okay, Harris says, thank you, Mark. Help put my mind at ease. Awesome. Uh, Srinath says, hi, Mark. Can we transfer our credit from U.S. to Canada? Um, I don't think uh, that is, well, I'm just looking here. I'm not sure if you mean a credit card. I'm not sure quite what you mean by credit. Um, probably not, if I understand the question. Usually Canada requires that you build your own credit from within Canada. Okay. All right, uh, Sif says, thanks, Mark. Khaled, uh, Khaled says, hey, sir. Uh, Rex says, thank you so much. Is there any other program for NOC Level C? Not really without, um, you know, one of the PNPs or a job offer, work permit, those kinds of things. Um, Jatin says, can I convert a visitor visa to work visa? Well, conversion really isn't the best way of describing it. You gotta have a job offer from a Canadian employer or otherwise qualify for a work permit. While you're in Canada, your work permit has to be, well, now with everything online, it's a little bit fuzzy, but you have to submit it online and you actually have to obtain your work permit outside of Canada or on entry. And so um, converting it probably isn't the best way of describing it. There are some exceptions to that, but generally that's the idea. All right. Um, uh, uh, Pius says, hi Mark, when is one year work experience counted for express entry with postgrad work permit? When someone has a job before the postgrad work permit, is it the date of issue on the postgrad work permit or submission date? Um, IRCC counts uh, work history for the purposes of CEC when you're on a postgrad work permit from the date that you submit your postgrad work permit application. So. Um, if you've got proof of filing that's and you've been working for the company, that's the date that they will count from. All right, um, I think guys, I'm gonna have to end right there. So um, yes, Srinath says credit history. I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to join me today. It was awesome and uh, I hope that it was helpful. We went through a number of different questions and I, I, I think I got to most people at least once and that's what's important for me. So I was happy to give this one hour and uh, I look forward to seeing all of you guys next Tuesday at noon. Um, as always, 
my express entry um, D, uh, Q and A sessions <laughs> are are sponsored by my Express Entry Do It Yourself guide, and this guide is now being hosted here on my new site. And you can go in and you can access a number of different options. And so I just want to share with you um, what's available. So you can purchase a monthly subscription. Um, you can the most popular is lifetime access, and like I said, you can. Uh, reach out with an email or instant message and I'll provide you with um, a 50% discount for you awesome people that are actually tuning in and watching live. And remember, there's always a 30-day money-back guarantee. And you can ask anyone. If On occasion, I do get someone who says, oh, I didn't realize that the uh, monthly $97 renewed automatically. Well, what do I do? I, I give them their money back. Now, if someone has been um, talks to me six months later and says they want all their money back and I've seen that they've continued to access the course, then I'm probably not going to give them their money back. Um, but the 30-day money back guarantee, um, I honor that strictly. So if anyone goes in and says, hey, this isn't for me, then they can request to have their money back and there's a 100% money back guarantee. All right, so that are the, these are the options that are available and um, uh, to purchase the guide. And I hope all of you fine, fine folks out there have an absolutely wonderful day. And uh, thanks for those of you who are in my Express Entry Law private Facebook group for your participation, for helping one another, for just being collegial and just decent people. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And I will see all of you guys next Tuesday, same time, noon Mountain Standard Time. Take care and wishing you all the best as you navigate this crazy world that we call Express Entry. Bye.